Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patricia Campos Medina. I am an, a naturalized American citizen of Central American descent. I was born in El Salvador. Um, and I serve as the executive director of the Worker Institute at ILR Cornell. I am also a political scientist who examines the experience of immigrant workers in different stages of legality and temporality in the United States. Um, before we get started today, um, I wanna bring your attention to um, the indigenous land acknowledgement on the screen. Um, uh, and it was chose, I'm not gonna read it, but I wanted to acknowledge that um, as, a, as I was gonna speak about the experience of indigenous Mexican immigrants that we sit uh, on, the, uh, on the ancient lands of the um, Odinoshone uh, Federation and that my alma mater, Cornell University sits on the ancient lands of the Cayuga Nation. Um, it's important as we study uh, the experiences of native uh, uh, immigrants that we also acknowledged uh, the contributions of uh, they had made to our country. Uh, today, I will talk about the research um, that I have done on tandas and cooperatives, uh, which are, are, are engaged on to understand the financial survival of indigenous Mexican immigrants settled in Prefambo, New Jersey and Staten Island. My co-authors are Erica Nava and Sola Mendi. They're both uh, qualitative researchers. Um, I was doing this work uh, of understanding Mexican immigrant experience at a time of the pandemic. And it was uh, very um, uh, revealing to me because at a time that we were demanding support for excluded workers in the form of, um, of a state support of un unemployment insurance or any kind of, of, of um, of relief efforts, uh, undocumented immigrants could not have, could not um, uh, qualify for any of those benefits. So they had to rely on their own social economy and their own ability to survive, to be able to also go to work because they were also essential workers and provide for their families. So this uh, is a study on the social economy in the middle of a pandemic became sort of like um, an eye opener as to what it takes for low wage immigrants, racialized immigrants to survive. Um, in the United States, uh, um, for immigrants to survive their displacement of their place of origin, uh, they have to resort to the social economy. And we'll explain later um, what, that, uh, what that, uh, that is. But I wanted to give you a little bit of the background of this research and what it is important. Um, for, uh, for those of us who advocate for, for the rights of low wage workers in the United States, we often um, want to remind um, the American public and our colleagues overseas that in the United States, we have um, 11.5 million undocumented workers who are active participants in our economy. And they have a participation rate of about 80, 85%. 60% uh, of those undocumented immigrants are Mexican uh, nationals. Um, Mexica's indigenous migrants have few options for access to US citizenship rights. There's no, there's impossible for a Mexican immigrant to become, uh, have a clear path to become a citizen. Um, and they, be, they have become the essential component of the low wage workforce in the United States. Um, the history of legality of, uh, of immigrants in the United States has, um, um, has um, exclusionary and racist uh, history. Um, since, the, since the founding of the United States, uh, who, has, who has been given access and who has the right to become a citizen has been predetermined by capitalist ambitions of the European settlers. Um, laws of entry into the United States uh, have been connected to the expansion of wealth accumulation of European capitals from the disposition of the land of the Native Americans to the imposition of slave labor as a form of economic development, the annexation of the former Spanish uh, colonies, and, and, uh, and now the illegality, the continued illegality of uh, Mexican and Central American migrants to the United States. Political scientist Cedric Robinson called this practice racial capitalism because it purposely creates exclusionary economic systems to deny future descendants of Native Americans and African slaves the rights to equality in the workplace. 
the two case studies that I talked about today um, it, uh, are uh, a snapshot of how Mexican uh, indigenous migrants survived the exclusionary regimes uh, of the economies where they settled. Um, this study is subject to empirical and quantitative data constraints. Uh, at the time, there is no a specific, um, I wanted to, okay. There's no, there's no uh, big database about that is looking at the social activity, economic activity of Mexican immigrants. So most of this work is uh, based on qualitative ethnography, uh, immersion and participation in observations. Uh, we have spent uh, over a year uh, immersed in, uh, in a cooperative in Staten Island, which is called La Colmena. Then we spent some time uh, uh, working and observing Mexican immigrants in Perth, Ambo, New Jersey, and engaged in, quite, in ethnographic and, um, and uh, uh, research and interviews. And out of those, those in, uh, uh, experiences, we created case studies. And, and, and in the article that I submitted, you can, you know, I can give you a lot of details of the conversations and the details of the conversation, but I can give you all that flavor here. But um, what came out of that is, is this whole sense that the, um, that the key component of, of Mexican indigenous participation in the social economy is that they, um, they, they do it not just to survive economic exclusion, but also to create community among themselves. Um, uh, let me go more. Uh, why is it important as, as a, someone who, who studies labor rights in the American framework? Why is it important to look at the social economy? It is important because the United States system of labor rights, it is based on a, a worker complaint based mechanism. The worker has to feel empowered to file a complaint to activate redress for their rights. Uh, in what system of exclusion they access limits their ability to file complaints. And therefore, what communities of, of solidarity they created with their compatriots or in the local uh, societies uh, gives them a sense of belonging and a sense of their own humanity and, as, and their ability to demand their rights. So if we are going to look at the experience of undocu um, documented workers and how do we empower them to uh, file complaints to seek redress, then we also have to look at the communities in which they build power for themselves and their, to, to get their survival. So the first case study uh, is in La Colmena. Um, is, uh, this is a worker center, La Colmena in Staten Island. It's, uh, workers go there to learn about their rights, to uh, file complaints about the wage theft, uh, so it's a, it's, it's a poorly resourced worker center. They don't have a lot of money, but because um, but the workers there, um, when the New York City created a fund to fund cooperatives as a, as a mechanism for empowering low wage workers, uh, La Colmena applied for a fund from New York City, and they actually received um, a fund to be able to train house cleaners, um, uh, uh, nannies, uh, all um, and 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 so, um, um, women who were making so, uh, uh, clothing to become worker-owned cooperatives. I say women because the majority of the the women who participated in the worker cooperatives at La Comena are are women with families, and they do it as a as a uh, as a social empowerment for themselves, but also as a way to supplement their income and to have a little bit of control over their lives. Um, Critics of the New York City, um, um, uh, there's a lot to unpack in the worker-owned model. The, most critics believe that for low-wage workers, worker-owned cooperatives are really not disrupting the capitalist model because uh, a, a worker-owned cooperative still has to compete with, an, with, uh, with an other companies that are in the low-wage market and are lowering in standards. But what is valuable about the worker cooperative on model in worker centers is that it actually gives workers a sense of agency in their lives, setting up their working conditions, setting up their wages, and actually having a contract that makes them owners of something uh, in the communities that they live. Um, given, during the pandemic, um, we were in the middle of this research, in the middle of the pandemic, these women had huge contracts cleaning houses, cooking for families, taking care of children, and all of a sudden the pandemic is stopped. 
Um, so what they, in, in, yes. <laughs> and in the middle of that, they, uh, I remember um, they started getting calls and all their contracts were being canceled. And so they all, they swiftly were able to change their business model. And they actually began making a mask to sell to the police departments and to the, uh, the fire department. So they were able to quickly switch uh, uh, their gear and, and the women who were already sewing were showing the other women how to, how to use the machines and, and, and get going. So that was a sense of like quickly reacting to what was happening. So um, um, let me move to the study in Kerthambo. This is, a, it's not a worker cooperative, it's a tanda, which um, are uh, in, um, in, in African culture is called a rosca or, or the, the, all ethnic communities have a sense of social circles and lending. Um, the reason we ended up uh, learning about tandas in, in, the, in, in Berthambo is because I also do um, research with Central Americans and Haitian workers who are, who are in precarity because they are either undocumented or have TPS. And, and, the, and the, the, the way they survive exclusion, they, they survive their everyday oppression in their work is that they engage in these lending circles, which are for the Haitians are roscas and for Mexican immigrants are tandas. And that's how they supplement income uh, to survive uh, in, living in one of the most expensive markets for housing in, 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 the, in the East Coast. So one of the things that I'm gonna close with, uh, I had more to say, but what I wanted to say is that um, the immigrant community, uh, the Me Mexican community in Perthamboy, over and over again, we heard the stories of women being afraid to go to the bank uh, because they come from Mexico with a very complicated relationship with banks because they were excluded from lending from for the formal banking system. So they come here and over and over again, they will say, well, we don't go to the bank because I am undocumented. And if I get deported, they're going to keep my money. So instead of putting it in the bank, they actually lend it to each other and create these lending circles. And that's how they start businesses. They open restaurants, they do the street vendors. Uh, that's how they do the big quinceañeras. They just like, they lend each other money. So that's, um, you know, I, I experience in Mexico, they bring it up here, but they come here, they're still excluded from the formal banking system. So, but that's how they create these dynamic local communities of undocumented immigrants. If you go to Perthambo in New York, they're like, there's, they're, they see the businesses and the restaurants and they're thriving. And you wonder how, how are they able to do that when they have no um, legality, uh, which in the United States, we call that, we call that alien citizenship. If you're an, you are an undocumented immigrant, you actually are allowed under the regime to be an alien citizen because you are able to buy a home, you're able to have a business, you're able to actually act like any other citizen, except when you engage with the police or you or something happens, then you get arrested and you get deported, right? So, that, <laughs> so that's why they had to create this um, this uh, tangential systems of economic survival, which is the social economy. Um, finally, okay, I didn't move my. <laughs> Um, this work is based on on the social econo uh, the work on the social economy of a, um, a Canadian uh, feminist economist, Carolyn Hossein, um, and she has written a lot about how uh, excluded racialized migrants from the South survive economic oppression in the West. Um, so she teaches right here at University of Toronto. So if anybody wants to learn more about the social economy and how she examines um, the, the, the reality of undocumented migrants in the West. Uh, I, I'm part of her book uh, that's coming out in the spring of 2023, and we're gonna be uh, examining different cases of migrants surviving in the social economy in the West. So thank you very much.